Hello and welcome to this virtual driver's eye view of the Wells and Walsingham Light Railway. The railway, like many preserved and heritage lines up and down the country, is closed at the moment and it looks like the vital summer season will be severely affected as well. I'm one of the drivers on the line and I've been really missing steaming up and down the four miles of countryside and wildlife in a tiny narrow gauge Garrett locomotive. One lucky volunteer is currently isolating um, at the railway and he's been able to film a journey from Walsingham to Wells in one of the railway's diesel locomotives. So it's thanks to Matt that we have this footage to enjoy. So go and make yourself a cup of tea, perhaps sprinkle a bit of coal dust in it and sit back and enjoy as I join you for a cab ride on an evening sunlit jaunt along the smallest public railway in the world. If you enjoy this footage um, and this rarely seen view of the line, please consider donating the price of a ticket, perhaps, to our donation page. There's a link in the description. We're sitting at Walsium. The guard has made one last check for any stragglers, and it's about 1650 or 1700. And we gently ease the train out of the Walsingham loop. Three miles per hour, until the rear of the train is clear of the station mouth. Then we can accelerate the train up to line speed of no more than 10 miles per hour. This video has been filmed at a slower pace as the diesel loco used vibrated the camera somewhat at a higher speed. The last trip back from Walsingham is one of my favourite parts of a day driving on the WWLR. The busiest part of the day is over, and the few passengers, happy after a day's mooching around Walsingham's pubs, farm shop, and religious goings on, are grateful for the train's gentle rhythm to take them back. We pass along the back of some houses now. Several residents have put up benches to sit and watch the trains go by, and one friend of the railway has planted up the line side with a wonderful display of hollyhocks which come out later in the year. Usually, on the steam locos, I don't have a great deal of fire in the firebox at this point. I'll have put a shovel full on after having a poke around the clinker in the station, but that's about it. As you can tell from the gradient information, it's downhill from Walsingham for about three quarters of a mile, so there's no point building the fire up for a little while. When we do, it'll be a shovelful at a time, over about half a mile, to slowly build the pressure up. I aim to have the pressure at its highest, just at the bottom of each hill. If we build the fire up too quickly, we'll produce black smoke, which would be rather unpleasant for the passengers in the open carriages, and not to mention inefficient. Talking through this journey back from Walsingham reminds me of my first time driving on the line under the supervision of the much-missed late Kevin Baker. Kevin was a steady driver and amazingly economical with coal. He had an excellent sense of humour and I was honoured to learn from him how to handle the garrets. The first ever trip with a regulator in my hand and it was around here I made the first of three emergency stops that trip. The guard flagged us down, just as we were getting going. He got out, and ran back up the track, and uh, picked up a straw hat which had blown off. One of the passengers reclaimed it, uh, the guard blew his whistle, and we were off again.
rounding the corner now onto the landing strip, and in the distance we can catch a fleeting glimpse of the village of Whiten, just on the horizon. We'll be passing through Whiten later on in our journey. The mortal remains of an old plate layer's hut from the standard gauge days are on the right, just coming up. All that's left is the brick chimney and fireplace, covered in ivy, but still standing. This long, straight, high embankment is a good place to look out for hares hiding in the furrows and boxing in March. And fleeting glimpses of them darting in and out of the crops all the rest of the year round. We're now passing over Westgate Bridge, which carries us over the Edgar Road. There is frequently a large deep flood under this bridge, and one can't help but feel a little smug passing over the top of cars which have become bogged down um, when you're in a tiny little train. I have to hold myself back from shouting out, it's safer by rail, uh, as we pass over the top. Still steadily we um, drift downhill, and we're now approaching the infamous Barnard's Cutting. After the Standard Gauge Railway closed in 1964, this cutting was used as a landfill site. When the current railway was relayed between 1979 and 1982, this cutting was only partially dug out. 3,000 tonnes of waste were removed, leaving a sharp 1 in 29 gradient. A further 17,000 tonnes of material were removed in 1999, leaving an eased gradient of 1 in 60 with an S-bend. The Garrett locomotives with a full train in high summer sound excellent battling up this cutting, and it's the highlight of all Walsingham-bound journeys. It also shows off the articulation of the Garretts um, to its fullest extent. And as we round the S-bend, or the start of the S-bend, um, we can see the five mile an hour speed restriction board uh, ahead, which makes descent of the, of the gradient a very controlled affair, and the crossing at the bottom of the cutting is always approached with extreme caution. It was at this point on that eventful first journey, driving the line, that I had to make the second of the emergency stops. Once more a shrill whistle from the guard and a flutter of red from the back of the train saw the brakes being applied on the steepest gradient of the line. We came to a quick halt and the guard disappeared back up the cutting. He came back this time brandishing a pink flip-flop which a passenger had lost from their foot out of a window. The mind boggles. A lady rather sheepishly owned up to it and it was returned to its owner. We got underway again and I began to wonder if every trip would be quite so eventful. We can now see the Barnard's Crossing ahead and can check left and right for um, any vehicles that might be approaching. Plenty of whistling and um, a good slow speed sees us safely across. So it's now a quiet trot across another high embankment with stunning views over vast fields of crops. After we've acknowledged the train is across the crossing from the guard at the back, and we are well set to tackle our first hill climb and trip, which we can see just ahead of us. By this point, the fire is burning well, and I'll have usually taken the opportunity 
to make sure the gauge glasses are reading at least three quarters full, bearing in mind the water will be higher at the back of the boiler as the chimney is pointing uphill at this point. This is the climb where the locomotive is most susceptible to priming. It is all too easy to keep topping up the boiler to keep the safety valves quiet on our way down from Walsingham, and we'd pay the price for it right here. Priming is when water is picked up from the boiler in the steam takeoff and sent through the superheaters down to the cylinders. It is exacerbated by a high level of dissolved solids in the water, something which Norfolk's water is of. The priming is normally worse on the wells bound journeys because the dome on the garrets is closer to the chimney than the back of the boiler. By gently easing the regulator open and keeping a keen ear out for the characteristic change of tone and plume of damp steam from the chimney, which indicate that priming is occurring, we can make the short climb with little trouble. If priming does occur, the regulator must be shut down the drain cocks opened to avoid damage to the cylinders and then we can gently reopen the regulator. You can lose a lot of pace on a journey this way but it's very important to uh, make these precautions um, because filling the cylinders up with incompressible water can do a huge amount of damage not to mention all the other grit that comes out of the boiler um, with it. We've now crested the hill and we are on our way from Walsingham Estate onto Holcombe Estate land. The crossing ahead is consequently known as border crossing. I tend to be quite busy at this point in the journey. We've got the descent of the train to control with the brakes. There's a few shovels of coal to put into the fire to give us the steam needed to climb the long whitened bank ahead. In addition, depending on the pressure, I might need to use the injectors to add a little cold water to the boiler to keep the pressure from rising too much. We've got to slow down to 5 miles per hour for the crossing ahead, keeping a good lookout and sounding the whistle. We've also got to keep an eye on the train and our passengers. So uh, yes, a busy part of the journey this bit. But it's a lot of fun. Once over the crossing, we can accelerate up again to line speed for a quick dash across another tall embankment. I often catch a glimpse of the Fakenham to Wells bus here and tend to give them a wave. It's particularly nice for me to narrate this journey because of the glorious weather. The weather in North Norfolk can be quite changeable, but for the most part the weather is lovely, the skies are big and blue and the sun shines with a gentle breeze. However, for the last few years, Norfolk seems to have saved up its rain exclusively for the weekends when I'm driving. For at least two years I was blessed with not a single dry weekend. The local gardeners began to ask the railway when I'd be back driving during dry spells. The situation got so bad that one day it rained in wells whilst the train was in the platform and magically cleared up as soon as we departed for Walsingham. I spent the day under a little grey cloud, it would appear. We now approach Harrison's crossing and slow again to five miles per hour, but now the gradient has shifted, gravity can do most of the slowing down for us. We hope to have a good head of steam and the needle rising in the pressure gauge at this point for, once over the crossing, 
It is a long slog through the deep cutting up to Whiten, and if we want to keep to time, we mustn't dawdle in our acceleration back up to line speed. This part of the line is a favourite haunt of several birds of prey. There are many buzzards along the line, and kites have been sighted. A young owl once delayed a train by about half an hour on this stretch. Apparently, it was sitting quite brazenly on the rail as the train approached, and refused to move from its perch on the line. The driver brought the train to a halt, and it was only when he came to get out and shoo it along that this delinquent bird lazily flapped off down the line and came to rest on the next rail joint. The train proceeded in this fashion, rail joint by rail joint, till the top of the bank, and half an hour later the owl had had his fun and decided to flap off in search of some other modes of transport to torment. I still see this owl, who is clearly a keen train spotter from time to time. He now sticks to the quarter mile posts, mainly in the whitened cutting, and still waits for the train to approach before giving one last disdainful look at the approaching train and silently, haughtily, gliding off to the next post. We're now approaching uh, an original standard gauge halt, um, so this was Whiten Halt. The incredibly short platform dwarfs our tiny train as we edge our way up towards the crossing. Again, gravity doing most of the slowing down for us. There is a steep hump to pull the train over, and accelerating uphill away from this crossing makes the Garrett's bark very satisfactorily. This crossing is soon to be closed to all traffic, following several winters where the heavy beat tractors left great piles of mud over the line during the railway's winter maintenance period. Whiten is a request stop on the line, though it's infrequently used. Still, we do pick up and set down passengers here who fancy a look round Whiten and one of the several excellent pubs in the area. Just on our right, we can get snapshots of White and Village through the bushes. This is my favourite spot on the line, the loco working away, but nearing the top of the hill, I find I often have enough time to have a small moment of contemplation and admire the sun shining off the clock face on the church. I think I'm very lucky to be able to do this on the weekends. The moment of peace is all too brief, as soon we'll be reaching the top of the climb. With the gradient turning, we find there is plenty to do to keep our loco steaming. We've had the injector on for a fair portion of the climb, and the needle has now dropped on the pressure gauge. The fire is fiercely hot following the long climb, and as the regulator is closed, as gravity starts to us down the whitened bank, there is a danger of overheating the fire bars. To prevent this, we should keep a draught of air flowing through the fire. This was provided by the waste steam from the cylinders, but now the blower should be cracked open. By always keeping a draught going through the fire, the fire bar life can be extended dramatically and will never produce any black smoke from the chimney. 
on a on approach to the first of two road over bridges we now start to feel the gradient pulling us down the cutting checking the speed with the train brakes as we go it's time to inspect the condition of the fire we've now done the highest climb of our homebound journey but there's still a good mile of gentle climb ahead any thin patches are filled in with a few lumps of coal but there's no need to go mad With that done, for now, there is little else to do, but keep an eye on the speed, and the brakes, and the train and our passengers following us down, and enjoy the ride a little. as we pass under the second of the two road over bridges. We might notice perhaps that the pressure gauge needle has faltered in its descent and is perhaps even thinking about climbing by this point. So, we might need to use the injectors to keep the loco quiet as we drift further down the cutting. On the outbound journey, this cutting is quite a trial. It isn't quite as steep as Barnard's cutting, but it does stay quite damp, and the overhanging trees seem to cover the rails in a slippy sap, or worse, in the autumn, damp leaves. The garrets on the front of a heavily laden train heading up this hill will run out of traction well before they run out of power particularly the front engine of the two, which has less weight over its wheels. Sometimes there is nothing for it but to stop the train and lay sand on the rails ahead and try again, but occasionally, by reacting to any wheel spins rapidly and by being gentle and not greedy with the regulator, it is quite possible to keep crawling through the slippy patches. Reaching the top of this cutting after a touch-and-go ascent on a heavy train is one of the most rewarding parts of being a driver on this line. The line now opens out and we find ourselves once more on the top of a tall embankment with fine views over the gently undulating fields. The wildflowers here are glorious but are at their best a little later in the season. And it is an aspect of the lineside maintenance which the railway takes very seriously. Bees and butterflies are upped up as we pass the banks laden with yellows, purples and whites of the wild flora. It is a little embarrassing to be overtaken by bumblebees, I suppose, but unlike them, we're in no hurry. We hope that, by this point, the pressure gauge is reading closer to blow-off pressure than it was and the fire is in a good state with no thin patches nice and even all over we'd also hope that we've got a good three quarters of a glass of water at least and if all of those things are true then we'd be well set for the long but gentle climb ahead. So 
So we're now on approach to the borehole, as it's known. On the left is a water treatment plant, and the railway passes over a small underbridge, which is the access road for the plant. And just on top of this bridge, the gradient starts to change direction. So we can ease open the regulator and begin to take up the strain and start to haul our train back up to Wells. Along the straight run up to Warham, uh, we can see in the distance the level crossing ahead. Occasionally there is a deer or two, or another bird of prey wheeling overhead, but most likely we'll be chasing more partridge and pheasants along in a small frenzied flock. They probably make for some of the toughest meat in the country, after all the running up and down our railway they seem to do. To our right is Warham Camp, a hill fort in Norfolk. There's a rum old thing. The two concentric circles of earthwork are clearly visible on the side of a field sloping down towards a small river. The hedges here need cutting back, something which hasn't been possible this year due to the virus, but normally the fort is clearly visible. It's quite striking to uh, see it across from the train. We're now running up towards the site of a beautiful three-arch brick bridge which sadly had to be pulled down a few years ago due to a large crack which formed in one of its brick arches. It was an absurdly uh, overbuilt structure, um, bearing in mind it is in the middle of nowhere and carried little more than a farm track over it, but it was a beautiful one and a fe feature of the line which is sorely missed. This part of the line seems to be variously known as Five Oaks, or Four Oaks, or Three Oaks, or however many oaks there are. The large oak on the left, just here, was the reason for the third and final emergency stop on my first ever driving turn. The line flattens out uh, a little just before, and the changing gradient was enough to obscure from us as we approached uphill a limb which the tree had dropped onto the line in front of us a shout and a hasty application of the brakes once more avoided any drama. Between the two of us in the cab we rolled the branch off the line and were once, it, once more able to get underway again. I think after that trip I learnt to always expect the unexpected and to be on the lookout for it, an attitude which I have been quite grateful for on a number of occasions over the years. The gradient eases on approach to Warham Crossing, but we can once again let gravity slow us down. This video was clearly filmed in the evening, as the large flock of chickens, which loiter around this crossing, have gone to roost for the night. We've never hit one of these chickens, even though they seem to pay little notice to the trains passing through their domain eight or ten times a day. Warham is a request stop, and, just as Whiten, it is infrequently used. The passengers we pick up here tend to be welly clad families, and those slightly bemused that Warham Station, like many rural railway halts, is nowhere near Warham. Once on the crossing we can start to, once again, bring our train up to line speed, and once we've got the way from the guard that's all, all's well at the rear of the train, we can really get underway and attack the last of our final climb of the journey. The field on the right is normally devoted to the growth of Miscanthus grass, 
and makes a interesting change from the more usual cereal summer crop, sugar beet winter crop rotation of most of the fields around here. The um, shards of grass on the the blades of grass all over the track bed might indicate that the miscanthus has recently been harvested and some of the some of it is blown over from the field. This is the last we'll see of the evening sun as the rest of the line runs mainly through cutting or through trees so we'll enjoy the faint warmth and gold hues for just a moment longer. The line now turns to the west as we approach the final summit. If we left the fire perhaps a little too thin at the bottom of the hill, the needle may be dropping by now, but it's too late to recover pressure before the top of the hill. Fortunately, we can easily make the top with what we've got, but a few shovels of coal now will have a chance to catch nicely so that the fire isn't too burnt through once we get back into wells. The drivers get a wonderful view of the undulations on the line and you can really clearly see the brow of the hill ahead of us. Um, here's the gradient post that marks that and we're now over the top and on our way down into wells. The regulator can be slowly closed and the blower cracked open. The water rises in the glasses as the loco heads downhill. Although still over a mile away, we can start to prepare for well station activities now. It's normally a quick 15 minute turnaround in wells, with just time to run round, fill up with coal and water, check the lubrication, have a poke in the fire, empty the ash pans, make a cup of tea for the next run, and blow down the boiler. This last part is to manage the dissolved solids mentioned earlier. We try to blow down at least half a glass at each end of the journey, so we make sure the boiler is full by the time we get to the station so that we can do that. If we make good preparations now, the loco will be in a good state to get through the preparations quickly and to give us a chance to chat to the passengers and show them round the locomotive. Bridge 1731, or Warren Road Bridge, now approaches. Underneath it, the line is nearly level, and we need to crack open the regulator to keep our speed from falling. This is colloquially known as Roy's Bridge. Lieutenant Commander Roy Francis, who owned and built the railway, liked to hear the loco's whistles echo back to Wells, so that he knew all was well with the train after it left. When he passed away in 2015, the whistleboard was revealed in a moving ceremony. It reads, May his spirit be etched in steam and smoke in the Norfolk sky. So now all trains salute him passing under the bridge, accompanied by shrieks of delight by the children on the train, as we hi hurry back down into Wells. The gradient picks up again shortly after the bridge, and past one of the many trees our passengers are responsible for along the line. The apples from these orphan apple core trees generally taste revolting. 
a grave disappointment to those working on the track during the autumn. As we pass the half mile indicator, we'll be checking our water level and gradually filling up the boiler as we drift further down and towards the Midden Woods. The speed is controlled with the train brake all the way down, and I often slow the train down by a few miles per hour just as a precaution and to get a feel for the weight of the train before we have to bring the train to an eventual halt in Well Station. We get one last look at a big Norfolk sky and rather a nice sunset before plunging into the relative gloom of the Midden Woods. Just on our left the owner of the Midden campsite has constructed a, an amazing uh, tree house uh, set in the grounds uh, of a quirky um, garden full of statues and interesting um, upcycled items, uh, which is very interesting to catch glimpses of through the trees. And the campsite has a request halt, which you can see just here on the left. This is the Midden Halt. In this direction we'd most likely be dropping off those who have been out to Walsingham for the day. But when on the outbound journey we'll be picking up passengers here, and that always adds a degree of complication to the climb as starting the heavy train under the trees from a stand, often with a new fire which has only burnt brightly for a few minutes before the unwelcome stop at the halt, requires a high degree of simultaneous loco handling and boiler management. We pass through the woods here around a worked out pit to our right. A large pipe sticks out of the side of the hill, which I'm told is a protected site for bats. The fixed distance signal looms ahead. And after the customary two-beat blast on the whistle, we prepare the brakes to stop at the stop board around the corner and radio ahead to the duty manager at Wells. Shunting can take place in Well Station and we need to check that the points are set and locked and all safe for us to enter the station. This part of the line is on an embankment, but the hedgerows have grown up to give the feeling of a living cutting. And we now see down into the station, with the carriage shed right at the end. Of course, when this footage was filmed there were some items of rolling stock in the loop and hence we must end our journey at the stop board this time. But of course, on normal journeys, if we've got radio permission from the duty manager ahead, we can pass the stop board and carefully, at three miles per hour, drift down into Wells Platform 1. I hope you have enjoyed this guided journey with us in the cab of one of our locomotives and perhaps enjoyed it enough to consider donating the price of a ticket to our railway to help it to reopen after lockdown. It would be even better to see you at Wells Station to embark on a journey with us through picturesque Norfolk countryside once we reopen. We need your support through these troubling times to continue running our tiny trains on the world's smallest public railway to the delight of all.
for many years to come. Thank you very much for watching.